Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, sorry, uh, I didn't realize I was a few minutes late today. So um, uh, let me just start with a couple of announcements. Um, so first of all, I'm handing out uh, uh, problem set five today. This is the last problem set before the midterm. Um, actually, why don't you go ahead and start handing those back. And I'm also going to hand out um, a practice sheet with uh, just some words about uh, what the midterm is, what's going to be on it, uh, recommended problems for you guys to take a look at. Um, so just as an administrative uh, announcement, as you know, the midterm is in class on October uh, 20, October 22nd. Um, just a word about what's going to be covered on the midterm. Um, so what's covered on the midterm is everything up to and including uh, my lecture on October 19th, which is the Friday before the midterm. Um, so my, rough, my plan between now and then is that uh, this class, I'm going to basically be wrapping up the section of the course on special relativity. Um, I'm going to be out of town on Friday, but I've arranged a special secret surprise guest lecture for you on Friday. It's going to be very exciting. Um, it's going to be a discussion of experimental tests of special relativity, tests of Lorentz invariance uh, by one of the experts on the subject. Um, very exciting. Uh, I think you'll all enjoy it. And then starting next week, uh, I'm going to spend about a week on uh, general relativity. Um, so, of course, you guys don't know enough uh, math in order to have a complete uh, introduction to general relativity. But I'll explain to you some of the basic features and the physical principles that underlie general relativity. Um, that'll take us about a week, maybe a little more than a week. And then I'll give a very brief sort of, then you'll have the midterm, uh, and then we'll have a brief, perhaps uh, two to three lecture long discussion of cosmology um, before diving into quantum mechanics and atomic physics, which will occupy us for the rest of the semester. Um, so just a word about what you're responsible for on the midterm. Um, I will be discussing some basic features of general relativity next week. Um, you are responsible for that, but because uh, you won't have had a problem set on general relativity. Um, you know, I don't want you to worry too much about learning general relativity for the midterm. Um, basically, you should be familiar with what I say in lecture and familiar with those concepts. But I wouldn't uh, encourage you to spend too much time trying to do outside reading or uh, going through the textbook chapters on general relativity. Um, the focus of the exam is really going to be on special relativity. Uh, and on dimensional analysis. Um, as far as the types of problems that will be on the exam, um, the style of the problems uh, and the level of difficulty of the problems is about the same as that on a problem set. Um, but of course, it's a 15 minute exam. So uh, the length of the problems and the number of problems will be much less uh, than that on a typical problem set. Uh, so for example, I gave you a problem on a previous problem set about the Fizeau effect which involves um, determining the speed of light in a moving medium. Uh, that was uh, on last year's midterm exam. Okay. Um, so that should give you an idea of the sort of level of problem that we're talking about. Um, you know, as far as prepping for the exam, uh, read uh, the textbook, uh, go through the notes uh, and lectures uh, up to and including October 19th. Um, I've included here a list of problems taken from the textbook that I think are pretty good. Um, you know, uh, you don't have to look at those problems in particular. You could also look at the worked out problems in either of the textbooks. You know, Morin's textbook has a whole slew of worked out problems, um, both conceptual and technical, that I think are good to look at. Um, so now might be a good time, if anyone has any questions about the midterm, uh, to ask. Um, I don't want to spend too much more time talking about it. I'd rather focus on the physics, but yes. Uh, do we have any formulas? Uh, yes. Uh, no formulas. Uh, you, it's closed book, no text, no notes. Um, you can use a translation dictionary. Um, I don't think you'll need it, um, but you're welcome to bring one uh, if you like. Uh, but aside from that, um, no, uh, no uh, outside references. Okay. Um, you know. Um, my goal is not to test your ability to memorize formulas, but you should know uh, the important formulas. Yes, good question. Other questions? It's a little bit of a shame that it's only a 50-minute midterm. Um, 
Unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, uh, we could, in principle, try and find some time where you guys are all free for two hours for a nice, satisfying two-hour long midterm. But I know uh, uh, from previous experience that finding a time when all 70 people are free and available to sit for two hours uh, is an impossible task. So I think we're just going to have to settle for the 50-minute midterm. Uh, you know, just relax, learn some physics, I don't know. Don't worry about it too much. It's just grades. It doesn't really matter very much. Um, any questions? Good. Let's do some physics. So today I want to begin wrapping up our discussion of uh, relativistic dynamics. So I want to begin wrapping up this discussion with just a comment about forces in special relativity. So one of the fundamental principles of Newtonian physics that you have, uh, that has become so deeply ingrained in your psyche uh, that you probably don't even think about it anymore is that force is equal to mass times acceleration. And so in particular, the force vector acting on an object is going to be in the same direction as the acceleration of the object. And one important thing to note about special relativity is that that very basic feature of Newtonian dynamics is actually no longer true. So let's understand exactly why that is. So remember that the momentum of an object is the gamma factor 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared c squared times the mass times the velocity of the object. And the force... The analog of F equals MA in special relativity is F equals D by DT of this momentum vector. So of course when gamma is very, very close to 1, this is very close to um, mass times acceleration. But if we remember that the acceleration In, uh, as, this, as observed in a given frame is the time derivative of the velocity vector, then we see that the force is d by dt of not the time derivative of the velocity vector, but the rest mass times the velocity vector divided by our friend 1 minus v squared over c squared. So the terms in this time derivative which hit that v vector on top, will give you terms in the force that are proportional to the acceleration vector. But there will also be terms where the d by dt hits the denominator. And those are not going to be proportional to the acceleration vector. So what that means is force no longer points in the same direction as acceleration in special relativity. I'd like to spend just a minute working out these formulas in a little bit more detail, which will hopefully, hopefully give you a little bit of intuition as to exactly why that is the case. Yes? Okay, so in the denominator, you have a uh, v squared as a vector? Yes. So is that a by, by v squared, I mean the dot product of v with itself. Good, good question. Yes. Whenever I write the square of a vector, I mean the magnitude of that vector squared, the norm of that vector squared. Good question. That's a notation that I've been using implicitly so far in this class, but it's worth reminding ourselves of that notation. Any other questions? Okay, so let's just work this out um, in a bit more detail for a particle or an object moving in the xy plane. Okay. So that means that v squared is the sum of vx squared and vy squared. So that if you want to take the force acting in the x direction, that is d by dm times d by dt of vx divided by the square root of 1 minus 1 over c squared times vx squared plus vy squared. What is that? Well, that's 
m times uh, the sum of two terms. The first term comes from when the time derivative hits the numerator. So that's the vx dot over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Plus a term where the derivative hits the denominator. And what is that? Well, you get a vx on top. And you get 1 minus v squared over c squared to the 3 halves power in the denominator. And then you have to take the time derivative of, uh, minus, of minus 1 over c squared times vx squared plus vy squared. And so you get, what is that? That's vx vx dot plus vy vy dot over c squared. And there's a factor of 2 out front because you're taking the derivative of vx squared plus vy squared, which cancels the 1 half that comes because you're taking the derivative of something to the minus 1 half power. And there's also a minus sign from the minus 1 half, which cancels that minus sign down there when you take the derivative. And likewise, for Fy, we get the exact same expression except with the Vx's and the Vy's interchange. So let's stare at that expression for a minute. So the first term in that expression is proportional to uh, the acceleration vector, whereas the second term is not. So if I wanted to write this expression in vector form, you would say that the force vector is the mass times the time derivative of the velocity vector plus this correction term over here, which if you think about it, is the cube of our relativistic scale factor times the velocity vector times v dotted into v dot divided by c squared. So if it's not clear why this formula implies this formula, just work it out. So look at the x component of this formula for f vector. You'll see that the first term is this term here, and the second term is this term here, and likewise for fy. So this is an explicit form for the force on an object, written in terms of the velocity as a function of time. And you see that it's not just the time derivative of the velocity, but it's something a bit more complicated. And dot here in this expression, of course, stands for d by dt. Question? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. <coughs> Good. Questions? So, in order to understand this a little bit better, let's consider a very simple example. Let's consider the case where we have an object which is moving in the x direction, but not in the y direction, so that vy is equal to zero, but it's experiencing some force that's pushing it in the y direction, so that vy dot is not equal to zero. So I could have some object moving in the x direction, but then I'm subjecting, subjecting it to some force which will push it in both the vx and the vy direction. So in that case, what is f sub x? Well, you can just set vy equals to zero in this expression. And what do you get uh, just from this expression up here? You get mass times, well, let's combine it all together. We get vx dot times one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared plus vx squared. And vx squared is just equal to v squared because vy is equal to zero over c squared divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared to the 3 halves power. And we can then uh, collect the terms 
So you multiply that first term by 1 minus v squared over c squared in the numerator and the denominator and add it to the second term and the minus v squared over c squared cancels the plus v squared over c squared and you get m vx dot over 1 minus v squared over c squared to the 3 halves power. So that's f, the force in the x direction. Question. Sorry, I can't quite hear you. Yes. Yes, because note that, so if vy is equal to zero, so v squared is vx squared plus vy squared, which is equal to vx squared, if vx, vy equals zero. So, um, yeah, is that, is that clear? So what we see is that for a particle which is not moving in the y direction, but which is subject to some force in the y direction, that at that instant in time where it's not moving in the y direction, um, the force in the x direction is m vx dot. So let's write this as m vx dot times gamma cubed. Whereas the force in the y direction, well, we just need to look at this expression up here. So the force in the y direction is given by that formula just with x and y interchanged with one another. And so the second term here is then going to be equal to zero. So that the force in the y direction is m times vy dot divided by 1 minus v squared over c squared to the 1 half power or m vy dot times gamma. And the important fact here is that we have different powers of gamma. So we have gamma cubed for fx and gamma to the first power, gamma to the one for fy. And remember that gamma is bigger than one. So this is saying that the force in, sorry, uh, yeah. This is saying that it takes less force To accelerate something in a direction transverse to its motion. In particular, let's say that I have an object that's moving in the plus x direction at some velocity that's very big. Say it could be of order the speed of light, it could be relativistic then if you want to make that object move even faster in the x direction, you have to put a lot of force on that object, more than you would in Newtonian physics. But if you want to accelerate that object in a direction transverse to the motion of the object in the y direction, then you don't need to put as much force on it. So this reinforces a general lesson, which is that if you have an object which is moving relativistically, and you want to accelerate it even faster, then you need to put a lot more force on that object than you would in Newtonian physics. You know, if you want to think about this uh, intuitively, you could think about this in terms of the relativistic mass of the object. Now, I usually don't like using the word relativistic mass because I, I usually prefer to use relativistic energy. But if you think of gamma times m as the relativistic mass of the object, then as the object goes faster and faster and faster, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. So it takes more and more force to accelerate the object. Until eventually, if you try and make this object accelerate at the speed of light, you'll have to put an infinite amount of force on the object. So any finite amount of force cannot accelerate an object with mass equals with mass greater than zero uh, to the speed of light.
In order to accelerate something so that it would be going the speed of light would require an infinite amount of energy or an infinite amount of force. So with any finite system with a finite amount of energy, that's going to be impossible. So this is just another way of seeing uh, something that we've touched on many times in this class, which is that the speed of light is a fundamental upper bound on the velocity of any object with positive mass. Question. Yeah. Does it mean that it's impossible to accelerate something to speed of the light it has to like spontaneously go through the speed of light? That's absolutely correct. So we've seen that objects with zero mass go the speed of light. Photon always goes at the speed of light. And uh, so you either have objects with zero mass that are always moving at the speed of light, or you have objects with uh, positive mass that can never go the speed of light. And never the twain shall meet. It's not quite true, but it's a nice way of saying it. Yes? Um, <coughs> you also mentioned in, in Bernstein that particles with no mass, like photons, can never move slower than the speed of light? That's correct. Absolutely. So what about the effect we had with water? Is it the propagation speed? Ah, yes. Uh, an important thing to notice is that uh, light traveling through a medium can travel uh, slower than light in vacuum. But that's really not that light is moving. So if you think about it uh, microscopically, it's not the case that light is moving uh, at a speed less than three times 10 to the eight meters per second. It's rather that there's some collective excitation of the medium that is similar to light, but is not actually light, that is moving slower than three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So for example, people even cooked up mediums, media, I suppose you would say, uh, where light can move uh, you know, 60 miles an hour, something like that. Um, people cook up these Bose-Einstein condensates um, where the index of refraction is of order you know, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, something like that. So, light, so excitations that you would call light moving through a medium uh, move slower than the speed of light in vacuum, but uh, that's not uh, in, in contradiction with special relativity because it's really some collective wave of the medium that's moving slower than light in vacuum. Question. So if you send a signal like through a tether pulse of light or something through um, water, it would reach the other end of the water at the speed of light? Uh, no. What happens is that basically, I mean, it's unfortunately, if you think about light as a particle, you know, and in, 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 intuitively here I'm using a, a particle metaphor for objects, then it's difficult to understand why, um, you know, how this works. If you want to think about it as particles, you could think about the light moves through water, like a photon moves through water, but it keeps bouncing off of these water molecules, okay, and that slows it down a little bit. So each individual trajectory where the photon bounces from one water molecule to another is at the speed of light in vacuum, but the overall collective motion of the photon is going to be less because it's, it's slowed down because it keeps bouncing off of these uh, water molecules. Now that is a, a, a sort of inaccurate picture because you should really be thinking of light as a wave in this context. And so when we talk about quantum mechanics, we'll talk more about particles and waves and when one description is right versus the other. But for example, in your electromagnetism classes, you have seen or you will see um, the equations which govern light in a medium. And in that case, the thing which travels at a speed less than the speed of light is not the electromagnetic field itself, okay, not the fluctuations of the electromagnetic field itself, but rather some fluctuations of some collect collective variable that mixes the electromagnetic field with the behavior of the medium. That's a little uh, uh, uji-buji, like that's not a very precise statement, um, but that's the best that I could do, uh, that I can do at this point. Yes? Uh, can you have massive particles travel across and massive particles in matter? Or um, sure. But I mean, where by traveling in matter, we mean the collective excitation, blah, 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 that I just said. You could take your Bose-Einstein condensate where, um, uh, where light, you know, where light travels at 60 miles an hour, 
something like that. And then um, you could certainly imagine some fluctuate, you know, sending some wave through that which might travel faster. It's important to remember that what we're talking about in terms of these fundamental principles are the properties of light moving through vacuum might be very close to light moving through matter. You know, the light moving in this room, even though it's traveling through air, travels at very close to three times 10 to the eight meters per second squared, um, but not exactly. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is introduce um, an example which will let us understand a bit more precisely and um, a bit more explicitly this fact that nothing, that even if you put a force on something forever and accelerate it forever, you'll never get it to exceed the speed of light. Um, so in particular, I would like to consider the following thought experiment. So let's consider a rocket. Okay. And let's say that this rocket has um, uh, an engine, okay, a motor, with constant thrust. And what does that mean? It's subject to constant acceleration, which I'll call A, as measured in the instantaneous rest frame of the rocket. It's important here to remember that um, a rocket, the acceleration that an object is subject to depends, of course, on the frame in which that acceleration is measured. And if I have a motor for a rocket that's putting out a constant thrust, then that means you have a constant acceleration, but a constant acceleration in the rest frame of the motor, the rest frame of the rocket. And I call this an instantaneous rest frame because it's a rest frame that's changing in time. At any given moment in time, the frame where the rocket is at rest would be different from the frame where the rocket is at rest at some other time. So let's let x of t denote the position of the rocket in the frame where the rocket is at rest at time t equals zero. So we have a rocket that takes off from the Earth, starts at rest at time t equals zero. It has constant acceleration, and I want to understand how its position, what its position is as a function of time. Now, of course, in Newtonian physics, you know exactly what the answer would be. It would be one half a times t squared. So x would be one half a times t squared in Newtonian physics. In special relativity, however, we know that that can't be correct because that Newtonian answer at late times would lead to a velocity that exceeds the speed of light, which I've already pointed out to you has to be impossible. So let's now understand the solution to this problem in special relativity. So this acceleration is the change in the velocity with respect to time, in, which is a constant in the rest frame S prime of the rocket. which in terms of the frame S, where the rocket is at rest at time t equals zero, is as above d by dt of x dot over the square root of one minus x dot squared over c squared. That's just our formula for the force being constant in the frame S as opposed to S prime. So I've just used our formula for the force being the time derivative of the momentum. Now, 
A is a constant. So that's an easy differential equation to solve. Okay. Even I can solve that equation. It says that A times T is equal to X dot over the square root of 1 minus X dot squared over C squared. And in, in principle, there could be a constant of motion there. There could be an additional constant of integration that comes from solving that differential equation. But because I have chosen my initial conditions so that the velocity x dot is equal to zero at time t equals zero, the constant of integration there is just going to be zero. Or if I want to rewrite this formula a little bit, I could rewrite this as one over the just by dividing the numerator and denominator by x dot squared. I could write this as 1 over the square root of 1 over x dot squared minus 1 over c squared. Or I could solve for x dot. So that says that x dot to the minus 2 is 1 over the square root of 1 over a squared t squared plus 1 over c squared. What have I done there? All I've done is inverted that formula, squared it, and moved the 1 over c squared onto the other side. Or x dot is equal to that quantity. So 1 over the square root of 1 over a squared t squared plus 1 over c squared to the minus 1 half. In order to understand that equation a little bit better, let's uh, simplify it a little bit. Okay. So that says that x dot, wait, did I get a, did I make a mistake there? Yeah, sorry. There's no 1 over a square root there. It's just that square root, right? Yeah, everyone see that? What have I done there? I've inverted that formula up of this formula here and squared it so that I get a 1 over a squared plus t squared. Okay, I've totally gotten that wrong. And there's no square root there. Either. Right. 1 over a squared t squared plus 1 over c squared. Good. See, I trust you guys to correct me when I make mistakes like this. <coughs> so that x dot is 1 over a squared t squared plus 1 over c squared to the minus 1 half power. Yeah, my notes are complete, completely wrong. Okay, that's okay. We don't need notes. Um, so that x dot, well, let's just write that out in a little bit more detail. So that's one over the square root of 1 over c squared plus 1 over a squared t squared, or multiplying through by a t on the numerator and denominator, a t divided by the square root of 1 plus a squared t squared over c squared. So what does this look like? So the first thing to notice is that when t is very small, the denominator is very close to 1, and so this is just a t. So that's, it's, it goes like a t when t is small. 
However, when t is very large at late times, the denominator goes like that one is negligible, and so the denominator just goes like a, a t over c, and so it goes like t, sorry, it goes like c when t is large. So at very early times, the velocity of the rocket is at, just as we would see in Newtonian physics. And at very late time, the velocity will approach the speed of light from below, and it'll actually equal the speed of light only if you accelerated it for an infinite amount of time. So at any finite time, the rocket is still moving less than the speed of light, even though it's been subject to a constant acceleration for a very, very long time. So if you wanted to plot what that looks like, then um, at early times, the velocity is very close to at. And so the velocity will look like that. But at late times, the velocity will asymptote to the speed of light. So the velocity asymptotes to the speed of light at late times. Now, in fact, we can take this one step farther and actually solve for x as a function of t. How do you do that? Well, x dot is dx by dt is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 over c squared plus 1 over, or let me write this as at over the square root of 1 plus a squared t squared over c squared. So that x, just moving the dt to the other side of the equation and integrating, is the integral from 0 up to t of at dt over the square root of 1 plus a squared t squared over c squared. And this is a straightforward uh, integral. Um, should I do the integral for you or should I tell you the answer? You want the answer? You don't want me to do the integral? Okay. I'll just tell you the answer. It's c squared over a times the square root of 1 plus a squared t squared over c squared plus a constant of motion, constant of integration. What is that constant of integration is determined by saying that we'll just set x equals to 0 at time t equals 0. That's just my choice of origin for the x-coordinate. So that means I'll subtract off 1 there. So what does this look like? Well, so at early times, x goes like 1 half a t squared. You can see that by just taking t to be small, Taylor expanding that square root to first order in a squared t squared over c squared. So what happens when you Taylor expand the square root? You get a 1, which cancels that minus 1. And then you get plus one half a squared t squared over c squared. The, uh, oh, sorry, there's no a squared there. There's an a. Um, uh, so that you get, uh, the a squared, one of, one power of a cancels the a in the denominator. The c squares cancel. So that x goes like one half a squared t squared at early times. And at late times, x goes like ct. And in fact, you can check it goes like ct minus a constant. Where t naught is given by c over a. So that's easy enough to check. Um, at large time, you can again Taylor expand the square root, but now you factor out an a squared t squared over c squared out front, 
to get a C, an overall factor of C. And then you Taylor expand again uh, the one there, and you get a correction term, which gives you that T naught term. So what does this look like? So let's plot this on a space-time diagram. So at early times, we have x going like one-half t squared. But at late times, x is approaching c times t. So it's approaching something at the speed of light. So it's asymptoting to a straight line, which intersects the t-axis at that time t naught, which is equal to c over a. So there's a reason why I drew this picture because it makes clear something very, very interesting. So let's imagine that you've gone off in this rocket ship at constant acceleration, but I'm left here on Earth at position x equals zero for all time. And let's say I want to keep assigning you problem sets uh, while you're accelerating off in this rocket ship. So once per week, I email you a problem set, and I send you this problem set uh, uh, via Wi-Fi, so it's traveling to you at the speed of light. And so, you know, after one week, you haven't accelerated very much. And so the problem set travels via a light ray, so it travels on a 45-degree line, and so it will reach you uh, no problem. The second week, it will still reach you, now after quite a bit of time. But the third week, The problem set will never catch up with you. <laughs> Lucky you. And in particular, so what does this mean? This means that there is an event horizon separating the two of us. So this is an event horizon. Now, you may have heard the words event horizon associated with things like black holes. But in fact, there's a much simpler context in which they arise, which is observers that are related by some sort of acceleration. Okay. A signal sent from x equals 0 at some time t will never reach the rocket if t is greater than t naught, which was c over a. Never. Even after an infinite amount of time. And you could ask, what would these Wi-Fi signals look like in which I try and send you the problem set? So, the first problem set that I send you, uh, let's say I send it to you via radio signal at a particular frequency. Well, at, after one week, you'll be moving at some velocity away from me. And so that radio signal will be redshifted slightly. Okay. The frequency of that radio signal will be less uh, than it would have been uh, if you were at rest. And for the second week, it'll be redshifted even more. The third week, uh, well, it'll never get to you at all. But if I were to try and send you the problem set a little earlier, just before time t naught, you would see that the signal would be redshifted and redshifted and redshifted until this event horizon is reached, where the redshift factor would be infinite. So this event horizon can also be regarded as a surface of infinite redshift. If I, sitting at x equals zero, am constantly sending you signals uh, at all time t, then the signals that I sent you, send to you as t approaches t naught will become infinitely redshifted. And in particular, eventually, they'll become completely unobservable to you. Because you know, if I redshift a signal so that its wavelength is now the size of the universe, okay, 
You'll never be able to read it. So what we see here is that an event horizon, which is a surface uh, of causal separation between observers, is in fact a rather general feature, not just of general relativity, but also of special relativity, if one is considering accelerating observers. So in particular, the observer, the accelerating observer, and uh, the observer at rest are causally separated. in that it is impossible for me, uh, standing here at x equals zero, to ever causally influence you and the rocket. But the converse is still is not true. You could always send me a signal. You can for eternally return your problems, turn your problem sets into me, okay? Why? Well, because it's always possible for you on this accelerating trajectory to uh, email me uh, and it'll reach me back at some finite time uh, because that would just travel along some 45 degree line moving to the left, but it's impossible for me to contact you. In fact, this event horizon has all of the same features that a black hole event horizon has. And so this is a great example to think about if you want to try and understand black holes. Question? Uh, if we send the message from uh, rocket, it's possible that it be like completely registered also? Um, okay. Um, yes. So actually, uh, you know, at any finite time, it'll be redshifted by a finite amount, but at very, very late time, it would be redshifted by a nearly infinite amount. Correct. Yes. An event horizon is really uh, a consequence of the fact that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. You've seen that very explicitly here. Okay. So without a notion of an absolute upper limit on velocities, there's no notion of an event horizon. So what's some intermediate time, do you say that if they're not exactly causally separated, but one thing the other? Is that yeah, I guess you wouldn't say that they're causally separated, uh, but that the causal structure is more non-trivial than you would naturally expect. You, you know, if you have two people sitting next to each other, uh, not accelerating with respect to one another. One can A can influence B and B can influence A. Uh, but here's an example where the converse is not true. Let me just um, put in a couple numbers here um, just uh, to help you uh, put this a little bit in context. So let's ask, what is the time scale for a rocket? Accelerating at 1g, so that a is, you know, 1g, which is 10 meters per second squared, to reach relativistic speeds. Well, there's a useful mnemonic here, which is just some statement about the units that we happen to like to use to measure things. But 1g acceleration times one year, it's pretty damn close to the speed of light. Okay. That's just a useful mnemonic okay, for obtaining order of magnitude estimates for these sorts of problems. So that means that if you are in a rocket ship that is accelerating with constant acceleration, 10 meters per second squared, it takes you about a year in order to obtain relativistic speeds. Okay. So you could then ask the question, uh, just a second, um, if you get in a rocket ship that can accelerate eternally at one me 10 meters per second squared, how old will you be when you reach the edge of the observable universe? Okay. 45, how many billion light years away? And uh, not, you're not as old as you might think. The universe, okay. Uh, yes, uh, but... Pretend the universe is not expanding for the purposes of that problem. Yes? Assuming that G is infinite, that you accelerate with, would the light be able to catch up with you infinitely? 
sorry. If you t if you you want to take the acceleration a to be infinite, yeah. um, well, um, if the acceleration a is infinite, you'll move out of my. You'll I'll be you'll move out of. I won't be able to communicate with you after some time t naught. That's very very small. So you'll approach the speed of light instantaneously. Yeah. I mean, indeed, if you take a to be infinite, then you will in a sense, get to the speed of light instantly. Okay. instantly. And then you would be able to send me that message at the same time, therefore. I, well, no, I would be able to send, if, if you take the limit where A is very large, then I, T naught goes to zero. So I would only be able to send you the zero problem set. Okay, I could never send you any of the other problems. <laughs> so yes. when uh, you're at the event horizon, you know, like, um, or it's probably a close and uh, the, the light laser will be uh, redshifted? Yes. So if you have thought about that as photons, Well, it means from a practical point of view, you can't infinitely redshift a photon. So it means there's sort of a last photon. Okay. Um, when I talk about redshift, I'm implicitly using the wave description. Yeah. But when I talk about photons, I'm using a particle <laughs> description. So you need to be a little careful. Okay. Um, in comparing those two. But from a practical point of view, it means there'll be a last photon. Uh, yes? Um, so the, yeah. the friend, if we, if we, supposing the Mars mission, which is supposed to take six years or something, if the uh, uh, rocket that we had uh, is basically not be able to If the rocket accelerates with constant acceleration, then you will not be able to communicate it. So you can use this mnemonic. Uh, I should really end. I'm late. But you can use this mnemonic to estimate about how long that would take. If you have a rocket accelerating at 1G, it'll have to accelerate for a year in order to, uh, for there to be an event horizon. Okay. Uh, I'll let you guys go. Um, I will see you on Monday. But there is a super secret.